The second chapter discusses environmental degradation and its possible economic related causes. The key questions that will be addressed are What is environmental degradation? What causes environmental degradation? The key concepts discussed are environmental degradation, market failure, externalities, property rights, public goods, policy failure, and institutional implementation failure. Remember to add this to your glossary. Environmental degradation is the overexploitation of natural resources and pollution from economic activities. Examples of overexploitation of resources are the overharvesting of rainforests and other forms of deforestation and extinction of species and endangered species due to loss in habitat or hunting. Examples of pollution include air and water pollution, leaching of chemicals and salt into the soil and soil erosion. Environmental degradation occurs worldwide in both developing and developed countries. However, the social impacts are felt more strongly in developing countries due to the higher dependency on natural resources and the larger proportion of individuals that are based in rural environments. There is an ongoing debate regarding the environmental degradation caused by poor individuals compared to wealthy individuals. It is argued that due to the higher demand for consumption goods, wealthier individuals use more natural resources and pollute more than poor individuals. That is, they have a higher ecological footprint. However, poorer individuals directly use the environment to survive and may be forced to use marginal land when others are not available. Furthermore, the lack of services such as sanitation and waste removal services place added pressures pressure on the environment as it has to simulate this. The effect of poverty and the lack of education may also cause environmental degradation. The possible causes of environmental degradation are market failure, policy failure, institutional implementation failure, and population growth and poverty. Each of these will be discussed in more detail below. The most important economic cause is market failure. As you are aware, a market is the place where the demand and supply of a good is determined, where supply and demand are equivalent and equilibrium price and quantity occurs. Market failure thus exists where there is either an incorrect equilibrium point, that is, all the costs and benefits are not taken into account, or if no market exists. Possible causes of market failures are Imperfect competition, where firms can set prices or quantities to maximize their profits. Imperfect information, where consumers or producers do not fully know all the information relating to the market. For example, if a consumer knew that a can of cold drink was cheap at shop A, he or she would purchase it there rather than at shop B. In the case of perfect information, producers would be forced to offer similar quality and prices of goods in order for consumers not to be biased towards them. Public goods, that is, goods that will not be produced in optimal quantities by the market. For example, street lamps. It is almost impossible to force people to pay for their insulation and maintenance if offered by the market. Inappropriate government intervention, externalities, and property rights. Of these, public goods, externalities, and property rights will be discussed further. An externality occurs when an economic agent has a transaction that affects a third party. For instance, if you and I are neighbours and I decide to play my music loudly, you may like the music, in which case you're experiencing a positive externality, but if you dislike the music, you'll be experiencing a negative externality and would want me to turn it softer. This cost of benefit that you would have experienced from my music was not considered by me when I turned up the volume. Similarly, Producers and consumers do not take into account the effect they have on others when an externality occurs and thus the prices of the good is distorted. This distor distortion leads to either an over or under production of goods depending on whether the externality was positive or negative. Other examples of externalities are education. As an individual, you may, be, you may invest in an education and will reap the benefits of that education. Society would also receive a benefit from that investment in terms of your individual contribution and overall better education. However, not enough will be invested in education and thus it is a positive externality.
An example of a negative externality is the pollution of water resources. If a village lived downstream from a factory that discharged untreated effluent into the river, this would have a negative externality on the village in terms of poor water quality and increased health risks. In this diagram, MB represents the marginal benefit derived by society, in this case equivalent to demand, and MPC represents the marginal private cost equivalent to the supply. In this market, where externalities are not taken into account, the equilibrium is E1 with price P1 and quantity Q1. The production of this good, however, creates an externality MEC, which is the marginal external cost. This results in a societal cost or marginal social cost, MSC, as presented. The externality at this specific equilibrium is A, 0, E1. If the externality were to be taken into account, consumers would demand less and only Q2 would be produced at price P2. Thus, the existence of a negative externality leads to the overproduction of a good and thus society pays for this additional social cost. The internalization of this cost by firms would lead to a higher price being charged and less of the product being produced and thus a, de a decrease in the externality. Property rights need to have the following three characteristics in order for them to lead to efficient resource use. Property rights need to be exclusive. This means that only one individual or group of individuals must have allocated rights to use the resource at a specific period in time. This individual would thus incur all the costs and reap all the benefits of managing and using the resource. Transferable, thus this individual may either sell, lease or bequest his or her rights to another individual. The owner would thus be assured that they will reap the future benefits of the resource. Enforceable, the property right is enforced by law, therefore it cannot be encroached or seized by another party. If any of these characteristics are missing, the incentive to use the resource efficiently is undermined and could lead to degradation as the incentive to invest in the sustainable management of the resource is at risk. It is important to note that these characteristics are necessary for sustainable management but may not be sufficient to ensure sustainable use. There are four types of property rights that are in existence. These are open access resources, communal property, private property, and state property. Open access resources exist where there are no existing property rights. This means that no one bears the costs or benefits of sustainable management of the resource. Thus, there is a high incentive for individuals to maximize their personal use of the resource and extract the resource in an inefficient and unsustainable fashion. As a result, environmental degradation is the norm. Examples of open access resources that are exploited are overfishing in open sea fisheries and overgrazing of natural felt. A classic example of this is the tragedy of the commons. In this story, a group of shepherds would bring their sheep to graze at the commons. The commons was an open felt or grassland. As no one owned the commons, some of the shepherds soon started to bring more sheep to graze. The other shepherds seeing this also had an incentive to add to their flocks, and this created a cycle as each shepherd wanted to maximize their use before someone else used more of the commons. As a result, within a fairly short space of time, the commons was degraded and no one was able to use it any longer. Communal property is associated with traditional property rights where community or group of users manage or govern the rights to use a resource. This resource is usually owned by the state. The sustainable use of the resource is determined by the level of trust within the community, security from outsiders intruding and having access to the resource and that users are only using the resource for subsistence use. A sudden switch by some members to receive economic gains from resource use could quickly deteriorate into an open access scenario. Also, a high population growth would lead to greater demand for the resource and thus overuse. State property is government owned and managed. Examples of this are water resources and national parks. 
The government allows access and rights to use these resources through the following mechanisms. Permits for hunting, fishing, mining and fieldwood collection. Leases for farming, timber rights and safari areas. Quotas for fishing, timber and wildlife. And the acknowledgement of traditional management rights and decisions. This type of property right is sustainable if there is control over the access of the resource. There is effective monitoring of resource use. No cor corruption exists amongst government officials and there are low population pressures in surrounding areas. Private property rights have all three characteristics. This type of property rights system is the most likely to be sustainable. However, there are certain constraints to this assumption. Firstly, owners must be able to manage the resources in terms of finance as well as appropriate knowledge. Secondly, they must not be driven by economic or government incentives. For example, a farmer who is driven by economic incentives is likely to plant marginal areas and use unsustainable methods to maximize his personal gain, gains in the short term. A pure public good in essence is made up of only externalities, that is, there are no private costs or benefits that can be incurred. Examples of public goods include ecosystem services such as the nutrient cycle or the management of water flows and clean air. Pure public goods are non-rival. Thus, the consumption of a public good by one individual does not reduce the quantity supplied. Since the quantity of the public good does not diminish, there is no opportunity cost associated with its consumption. Furthermore, public goods are non-excludable. Thus, no one can be prevented from consuming it. This poses the problem of free riders. Free riders are individuals who conceal their preferences for the good in order to enjoy its benefits without paying for the good. Thus, the free market will underproduce public goods as individuals cannot be forced to pay for the good, nor can they be prevented from using it. These characteristics of public goods thus rationalizes government activity that is financed with general taxation. Thus, government provides a given supply and prices differ according to consumers' ability to pay. Policy provides principles and guidelines for societies to behave in a certain manner or direction for the achievement of specific goals. Policy failures occur when governments make decisions that do not reflect true social values or produce less efficient outcomes than a free market would. This often occurs due to government's well-meaning intentions that do not consider the environmental impacts of the decision. For instance, government may want to help the agricultural sector but do so by reducing the cost of environmentally harmful inputs. Thus, farmers use more of these and have a greater impact on the environment than before. Other causes are corruption, where government allows certain environmentally harmful practices to occur for their personal gain. Examples of government interventions include misplaced subsidies, price controls, physical output targets, and exchange controls. Policy failure can lead to resource degradation in three ways, namely, economic policies may affect the way individuals use resource inputs in the production process, regulatory policies governing natural resources may not be sufficient to correct market failures, and conservation policies may be poorly designed and implemented. Here we look at how economic policy affects the degradation of natural resources. Firstly, economic policy deals with production or output of a national, on a national level, prices, employment, international trade and finance. There are three types of economic policies. These are fiscal, monetary and trade policy. Fiscal policy deals with government expenditure and taxation. Fiscal policy can affect degradation as follows. Firstly, government can distort input or output prices by introducing taxes or subsidies. Taxes would increase price and thus decrease demand and or supply for a specific good, while a subsidy would decrease the price and thus increase demand and or supply for a good. Secondly, government may stimulate conservation efforts by providing subsidies to environmentally friendly practices or sectors. Monetary policy deals with money supply, 
interest rates, credit and exchange rates, and is implemented by the South African Reserve Bank. Problems usually faced by developing countries include high real and nominal interest rates due to high inflation rates, depreciating exchange rates, high levels of government debt, and balance of payment problems. In the case of monetary policy, the link between policy and the environment is less clear. Possible monetary policy effects are as follows. Depreciating exchange rates may make the increased production and use of resources more attractive as goods become more price competitive in the international market. This may thus lead to increased use of resources and higher pollution levels within the country. Trade policy focuses on international trade of goods and services. Trade policy can be either outward or inward focused, that is export or import driven. However, there is a tendency for some elements of protection for sensitive local industries against competing imports as well as that of infant industries. Trade policy affects domestic prices by either changing the prices of imports or regulating the quantities of products that may be imported. This has a direct effect on production and thus natural resource use, pollution and waste generation within the importing country. Local trade barriers can also be used to increase or reduce imports of polluting production inputs and thus influence the quantity of these inputs consumed. International trade barriers can create incentives to produce specific products that may have higher resource requirements than previously produced products or may increase production to unsustainable levels. Institutional and Implementation Failure Institutions are governments their policies, legislation and supporting regulations, where legislation defines the broad issues, sets objectives and definitions and identifies the legal mandate of government in a specific area, while supporting regulations determine the method of implementation, which may be specific rules, incentives, user fees or penalties. Institutions play an important role in terms of the effective management of natural resources and the environment. Institutional failure occurs due to the lack of necessary government structures, a lack of environmental legislation and regulations, and the breakdown of traditional land use management processes. The causes of these institutional breakdowns are, firstly, that the underlying statutes and regulations are not established, Secondly, there is a fragmentation between the responsibility and authority of the management of natural resources and the environment. This leads to fragmentation and gaps in the management of resources. Thirdly, legislation regulations are outdated and thus do not address changing patterns of use, pressures and conflicts. Fourthly, failures in regulations may lead to the unintentional encouragement of overuse or illegal use of resources. Institutions are necessary, but without effective implementation cannot be effective. Implementation failures occur due to a lack of technical capacity or skilled staff members and or due to insufficient financial resources. Other causes include the lack of data in terms of the resource base and uses thereof, lack of knowledge in terms of the total costs and benefits associated with the allocation of a resource in a certain manner and the lack of understanding in terms of the importance of the environment to the economy. Finally, the existence of corruption among implementing agents can lead to degradation. Population growth and poverty. The state of poverty results in a direct dependence on natural resources and the state of the environment for survival, especially in rural areas. In urban areas, that link is not usually as strong, but individuals are often forced to degrade the environment due to a lack of services such as sanitation, water supply and waste removal, and overpopulation on marginal land. There are two definitions of poverty. The first is absolute poverty. Here, poverty is defined as a minimum level of income, expenditure or calories that an individual needs to meet basic needs of survival. The second is relative poverty. Relative poverty is defined in terms of comparable income levels among a group of individuals where level is set and people below this level are considered poor. In this case, 
Poverty may never be dealt with, as a certain set of individuals will always be worse off than another set. It is assumed that with increase in poverty, there is an increasing pressure on the environment to meet these individuals' needs. This leads us to the idea of a poverty environment cycle. This cycle occurs as individuals become poor, they rely more heavily on natural resources, such as fieldwood, wild berries, etc. The increased use in, this, in these resources leads to environmental degradation, and in turn, individuals thus have less in terms of resources and thus use resources more inefficiently. The population growth rate in poor and especially rural areas tends to be higher than in urban and industrialized areas, and this contributes to the poverty environment cycle. Measures of poverty are used to determine the state of the poor and or the extent of poverty and development in the country or area. Several measures of poverty exist. These are the headcount index, depth of poverty, GDP per capita, human development index, and human poverty index. Economic sustainability has assumed that as long as the rate of population growth remains at least equal to the growth in real GDP per capita, a country will remain in its current economic state. However, the rate of growth in the expenditure per capita and ultimately the consumption rate of natural resources will also determine sustainability and the degree of degradation in a country. Please complete the following assignment. It is due on Wednesday the 22nd at 4.30 p.m.